Hi, my name is Kelsey Hightower. I'm a principal engineer working on Kubernetes and GKE, our managed Kubernetes service and our cloud native distributed systems. Maybe six or seven years ago, I was introduced to the world of containerization through Docker and also became a contributor to the open source Kubernetes project. And I've been working on Kubernetes since the beginning. I've contributed code, documentation, and even wrote a book on the subject. When I meet a lot of customers that are already running in the cloud, a valid response to the things that I talk about is, well, our stack is already working. The next question is define working. And so when I talk about Kubernetes, they're like, hey, we've been on cloud for over eight years. And I'm always impressed by that because in the early days, most people were very reluctant to go to cloud. But once I start digging into their actual setup, typically it's a lots of virtual machines and custom scripts some people even brag about how many lines of code that they use to deploy their applications to their servers. And I look at them and I pause and I ask a simple question, why? And what I think has happened over time is everything that they've learned has translated into hundreds and thousands of lines of configuration management code. But the truth is no one really wants to maintain that stuff long term. So when they ask me why Kubernetes, I'm saying all of that stuff that you've learned in the last 10 years, multiply that by a thousand companies around the world and companies like Google and Twitter and all of us all contributing those ideas to a central place. Well, that's what Kubernetes is. And so a lot of companies will take a look at their existing infrastructure. Maybe they're spending way too much money by having one application pinned to a single virtual machine. If you have tens and thousands of virtual machines, my guess, you're probably going about 80% underutilized. Most people in the industry have a hard time getting to 5% utilization in their virtual machines. So the immediate value of something like Kubernetes is simply taking all of those virtual machines. The truth is you probably only need 3000 instead of 10,000 and then letting Kubernetes play Tetris in your infrastructure. It does a much better job at scheduling how your workload should be run. So for many people, just because you were good at cloud 10 years ago, doesn't mean you're necessarily benefiting from cloud in 2021. And this is where you look at people's roadmaps, right? So if you are an infrastructure practitioner, maybe you work on the platform team, we all maintain a roadmap. If you take a quick look at yours, I bet you'll find things like we want better security. You want end to end encryption. You probably want to have a more consistent CI CD pipeline. Well, all of those things are currently not working. And so this is where you start to ask yourself, do I really go figure out how to build and then maintain all of those things on my own? Or do I try to accelerate my roadmap? The first option is to download the open source Kubernetes distribution and spend the next 30 years integrating it and running it yourself. I think there's a better option. I wrote a whole guide called Kubernetes the hard way that teaches people how to actually do this. But what's the easy way? That's where GKE comes in. And this is what we mean by a managed Kubernetes offering. And what that does is it integrates everything from security, storage, GPUs, and networking into something that's maintained by the cloud provider. If you take Kubernetes and all the best practices and time, you end up with GKE. So ideally, it's really hard to keep up with all the advances in the cloud. For example, we're constantly coming out with different VM types and sizes. We have things like preemptible VMs that can save you over 40% or 70% in terms of your compute spend. But in order to use things like that, you would have to go and do all the integration work yourself. What happens when there's a new security vulnerability in the open source project? Well, you will be responsible for tracing that down and patching it yourself and then upgrading all of your clusters. But many of our customers have hundreds, if not thousands of Kubernetes clusters. So what they can do is use a centrally managed control plane to do all of those tasks for them. I think what most customers do is they underestimate the long-term responsibility of building and maintaining custom infrastructure. And when it comes to infrastructure in 2021, there are some fantastic platforms that are already built. GKE comes to mind if you want a Kubernetes offering that's fully integrated. There is less and less value of building and maintaining these things yourself over time.
Kubernetes is only as good as the infrastructure it runs on top of. And the thing that makes GKE great is that it's our only container platform. Look, Google created Kubernetes and we stood behind it for the last six or seven years. We've gone all in. So if you look at Kubernetes on GKE or inside of GCP, you'll find all the deep integrations. For example, did you know that you can actually share a single GPU across six or more containers? Well, that's only possible because we've done some deep integration work to make that work. So for a customer staring this containerization movement in the face, what you can expect on day one is the need to repackage and take stock of your existing applications. So some customers may have 10, some customers may have a thousand applications. On day one, the most important step is to have a catalog of everything. And I'm talking about even that stuff in the dark corner that no one's touched in 10 years. All that needs to be taken account of. Once you have an inventory of your application stack, the next thing is prioritizing which things need to be containerized first. Now you're moving on to what we call day two. We're going to also assume that you're not going to waste your time trying to run something like Kubernetes from scratch. Do not do that. Now, if you click the button, like I'm recommending, your day two is going to be very different than some of the pain you've read on the internet. Now, what you can do as day two is once you have a containerized application, your next task is just to describe how Kubernetes should run that application. And that's where your team is going to spend a lot of time basically serializing their operational needs into Kubernetes configuration files. And then when those things are ready, you can point them at Kubernetes and start to transition your application at the proper pace for your organization. Now you're going to be in a state where some things will be running in Kubernetes and some things will be running in those virtual machines. And then when you get to day three, you're going to see a path where you're going to have a lot of repeatable patterns. And what those repeatable patterns are, you can apply back to the rest of your application stack. And the truth is some applications will run much better on virtual machines, but what you will find and what we tend to see is the far majority will benefit from running under something like Kubernetes, where you can benefit from density and consistency as you deploy across multiple regions and zones. I'm gonna be honest with you, installing Kubernetes or just using Kubernetes on its own is not gonna necessarily make your company more innovative but the time savings you get back from using Kubernetes will. Let me put this in perspective. Let's say you only have 100 engineers that work at your company, and roughly they work about 40 hours a week. You only have 4,000 hours to build all the products and services that your customers need. My guess, you never have enough people to get the job done, nor do you have enough time to get the job done. What if I told you that most companies are spending about 30% of their engineering capacity just building the platform. What we wanna do is give you the ability to take that 30% of engineering time and shift its focus towards building those applications and services that your customers actually need, use, and care about. The biggest problem for cost for most people is that their machines are over-provisioned. For example, you deploy one application per VM and typically, doing parts of the day, you might get to some high utilization. Maybe 60% of your CPU and memory is actually working to serve your business. But what about the other 16 hours in the day? What's going on at that point is usually you're sitting there completely idle. And unless your team is building a bunch of automation tools to scale things up and down to respond to your traffic needs, you're probably just wasting idle compute translating to wasted money. So how does Kubernetes actually help? Well, number one, there's this concept of bin packing. Look, it can be super complicated, but the easy way to think about it is, instead of putting one application per machine, and there's a reason why your team is doing that because it's actually complicated. What you do instead is you give all the machines to Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes does a job of packing those applications on where their spare capacity is. And when that is full, all your applications are running, it can automatically turn off the machines you're not using. And when traffic comes in again, Kubernetes will automatically spin things up. But that's where the cost savings come in. 
I'm often asked if Kubernetes is the end game. Is this the holy grail of infrastructure? If not, what's next? Well, number one is the Kubernetes API has become an industry standard. And I believe that's going to stick around for a while. But there's one thing that doesn't necessarily need to, which is the cluster that runs underneath. This is where GKE Autopilot comes in. Now, one thing that's nice about Kubernetes is it allows you to really bin pack and scale your infrastructure. The thing is, you have to tell Kubernetes exactly how you want it to do that. And that can also become a form of overhead and management that you may not want. And what we've learned over the last five or six years of running Kubernetes in production is we can automate that all for you, hence the name Autopilot. And given that new set of capabilities, meaning we can scale your infrastructure horizontally, we can even scale your workload vertically. And one thing we've managed to do is eliminate the entire cluster. So now we can make the VMs disappear. Now, not to worry, the Kubernetes API is still there and you can still use that to do everything for you, but we will even take care of the cluster provisioning underneath. So when you go from running thousands of applications down to just one, we maintain the infrastructure underneath and you don't have to worry about it. This is the next step on the path to serverless. And for those that don't need the Kubernetes API, you might want to take a look at something like Cloud Run, a completely serverless experience that allows you to take those very same containers that you were running in something like Kubernetes or Autopilot and get rid of the entire cluster and delegate the rest of that responsibility to us. Number one, I want to make sure that my team understands the state of the art in infrastructure. And if no one's heard of Kubernetes, you got to go solve that problem first. Step two, I will look at our team's infrastructure roadmap. And when I start to identify things that are already existing in the world of Kubernetes, I got to ask my team, why don't we just move to the industry standard platform and then innovate there instead of starting from scratch? Once you've made that decision that Kubernetes is right for you, I think the world of containerization gives you the next set of benefits. One big problem that's plaguing our industry right now is the security. No one really knows what all goes into our software. Who built your compiler? Where did those third party dependencies come from? And that's why I think you should make sure that in any of your strategies, whether you skip Kubernetes and go straight to serverless, I believe that the container format will be necessary in order for you to be able to make your first step to a secure software pipeline to make sure you understand where all the bits of your software are coming from. And once you adopt containers, then the entire cloud opens up to you. You can run containers on VMs, Kubernetes, Autopilot, or even something serverless like CloudRun. Infrastructure is a means to an end, but it can be extremely time consuming and expensive if you don't have time to do it correctly. So the whole value, the innovation, the truth is, the innovation comes from time. You need time to innovate, so using something like GKE will give you your time back. The net benefit is all that time that you get back, you can use it for something far more important, which is innovation, building the products and services that your customers care about.